So, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great uh, privilege and pleasure for me to uh, be able to moderate uh, this celebration of um, Aziz Rana's uh, truly exciting uh, new book, Two Faces of American Freedom. Um, I'm just the gatekeeper here. Um, I'll introduce our uh, speakers and uh, keep the time um, loosely. And uh, after each of the speakers has uh, had his or her say, um, there'll be an opportunity for Aziz to respond and then an opportunity for all of you to offer your observations or ask questions. Um, so let me begin, first of all, by the way, my name is uh, Greg Alexander, I'm on the back right here. Um, let me begin by offering a very brief uh, overview of uh, what is uh, a very complex, subtle, and insightful book. Two Faces of American Freedom offers uh, a new account of the American experience from the colonial period to modern times, placing issues of race relations, immigration, and presidential power in the context of shifting notions of empire and citizenship. It does so by focusing on how the country was first and foremost an experiment in settler empire, as Aziz calls it. Today, while the U.S. enjoys tremendous military and economic authority, citizens are increasingly insulated from everyday decision making. This was not always the case. America, Aziz argues, began as a settler society, grounded in an ideal of freedom as the exercise of continuous self-rule, one that joined direct political participation with economic independence. However, this vision of freedom was politically bound to territorial conquest and to the subordination of marginalized groups. While presentations of the American Revolution as a radical event often highlight its egalitarian aspects, Aziz maintains that the revolution was just as much about defining the future of imperial colonization. Aziz also reconceives American immigration history, illustrating how the 19th century's de facto open borders were tied fundamentally to an ethnically exclusive and republican vision of expansion. In essence, historic practices of internal liberty and external power were not separate currents, but rather two sides of the same coin. Nonetheless, at crucial moments, reformers and social movements sought to imagine freedom without either subordination or empire. By the mid-20th century, these efforts failed, resulting in the rise of hierarchical state and corporate institutions. This new framework presented national and economic security as society's guiding commitments and nurtured a continual extension of America's global reach. The book ultimately envisions a democratic society that revives settler ideals, but combines them with meaningful inclusion for those currently at the margins of American society. Our first speaker is Professor Nancy Rosenblum, who is the Senator Joseph S. Clark Professor of Ethics and Politics and uh, Government at Harvard University. Professor Rosenblum is, uh, uh, specializes in the history of modern political thought, contemporary political theory, and constitutional law. Her latest book is On the Side of the Angels, an Appreciation of Parties and Partisanship, published by Princeton University Press in 2008. She's the winner of the 2002 David Easton Award uh, for her book, Membership and Morals. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2010, 
was elected vice president of the American Political Science Association. She, in addition to several books, she's the author of countless articles and essays. And it's a great pleasure to have her here uh, at Cornell. Invitation. A few, minutes, a few months after his dissertation defense, Aziz sent the members of his PhD committee a CD. Here are a few of the song titles. Gallows Tree, The Night They Don't Drove Old Dixie Down, I Ain't Got No Home, Strange Fruit, which is about a lynching. The rest of the selections are all in this vein. They're all lugubrious. If they have harmonies, they sort of layer tears on tears. And it's not about unrequited love, either. These laments are about being ground down by the turns in American history, by civil war and the Great Depression and homelessness. Yosef Yerushalmi, who is a wonderful historian of the Jews, spoke of the Jewish lacrimose theory of history, and Aziz is an honorary Jewish historian. Of course, of course it's wrong to think that intellectual and aesthetic sensibilities are, 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 are always match. I mean, people aren't of a piece. And this music can't be a perfect mirror of Aziz's intellectual temper, since he describes himself as an embedded critic, and it takes at least an iota of optimism to think not only about how we got to be the way we are, but how we might be better, and to find resources in our damaged past, to find hope in what are, after all, lost causes. Now, in this comment, I want to, on two phases of American freedom, I want to do th three things. First, I want to reflect on the kind of scholarly work this is, its genre and its significant contribution. Then I want to raise a question about the political dynamic of progressive change. And finally, at this time, I want to make two meta-observations about Aziz's general orientation. What kind of work is this? Two phases of American freedom is narrative history, what once was celebrated and more recently disparaged as grand historical narrative. And Aziz calls it large, a large-scale act of historical reconstruction, which it is. This has always been an important strain of historical writing. Think Charles Beard. And recently, we've seen a revival of it in American history, increasingly amongst legal scholars. And I would welcome your speculations on why the legal academy has begun to take this up. Well, grand narratives have three characteristics. One is a claim that there's a key to history. And for Aziz, the key to American history is the enduring effect of our political origins as a settler empire. That settler exclusion is not a distant period of conquest and subordination, but a basic governing framework for America for 300 years. And the key in this dynamic is, the compa is comparative equality and self-rule seeming to require imperial expansion and the suppression of outsiders. It's also characteristic of this type of history to turn a thematic key into a narrative story with arcs and drama, with critical moments. And for Aziz, as I read it, the critical moments are populism at the margins of Jacksonian politics, radical Republicans at the time of the Civil War, the last two decades of the 19th century in the Populist Party, and the early 20th century when the United States really asserted itself on the global stage and took on a new imperial self-understanding. The disintegration of settler empire as a political and constitutional system uh, culminating, I think, for Aziz in the New Deal was slower and without so many critical turning points, though I think he believes we're at another turning point today. Now, the drama is particularly intense when, as here, the forces in conflict are presented as tied inextricably together as two faces of the same thing. So we learn that the unique American ideal of democratic freedom entailed imperial frameworks, that popular mobilization and direct control of political and economic decision making gains strength from practices of subordination, and so on. As a result of this drama, unraveling the forces can be an impossible political task. We might be able to want more American power from democratic self-rule, as, as Aziz understands and idealizes it, but it's difficult to imagine much less effect the liberation of an inclusive democracy for an empire. If we could, it would be a sort of end of history, as he writes it. So the second characteristic of grand narratives is that they are oppositional, sometimes because standard histories are simply wrong with damaging consequences. They induce illusion or paralysis, as the hagiography of the founders does, and Aziz rebuts. Sometimes because standard histories foster a misunderstanding of some essential feature. For example, we might recognize American as expansionist, but not see it as an empire. And therefore, we would miss how the United States constitutionalized conquest. We would miss how In Ray Debs, for example, is an explicit domestic application of imperial prerogative to industrial strife. And finally, opposition uh, history uh, is necessary because standard histories are fragmented. That is, the little threads aren't woven into a comprehensive narrative. 
For example, one of the threads of American historical writing is American anti-statism, that we see it as foundational and built into our individualism. And Aziz points out that the failure to set this in the context of a settler empire makes it that we see these as, episodic, as foundational, whereas in fact they're episodic, they present alternatives, uh, collect, notions of collective self-government, and they turn negative only when these alternatives fail. So let me look more closely at what I see as the main oppositional threads in Aziz's work, and two stand out. First, for roughly 40 years, since the 1960s and 70s, the new history paradigm has been cast in opposition to consensus history, the history associated with post-war and the Cold War, with confidence in American individualism and democracy and abundance, and the United States as a vital center. Consensus history emphasized continuity, and I recently read a wonderful example of consensus history, example, for, which is Morty Keller's new book on American political history called Three Regimes. Well, these new historians wrote, rewrote the past, emphasizing conflict by way of subdisciplines on women and African Americans and poverty and racism and sexism, and they identified new and old lefts and homegrown radical traditions, including the populace. This new history owed a lot, actually, to 20th century progressive historians, with the difference that progressive historians tended to emphasize progress as the unifying motif, and new historians don't. My point is that this undoing of consensus history is incomplete, that new historians turn out to have their limitations. And so we have Bruce Ackerman, for example, or Rogers Smith, and Aziz is a continuation in this vein. Historians like William Appleton Williams said American expansionism in the analysis of corporate-driven capitalism. Aziz reworks this counter-narrative using the framework of settler empire, continuing but altering the oppositional thrust of anti-consensus history. Now there's a second oppositional element, and that's to correct the durable idea of American exceptionalism. Not necessarily to deny it outright, but to get it right. And for that, comparative history is crucial. Settler empire is Aziz's original, and I think very interesting way of uh, getting, getting in. By setting the American experience in the framework of a typology of imperialism and colonialism, and in the framework of a typology of the relations between metropoles and indigenous peoples. And for me, this is the most original and important aspect of the work. I see Aziz's book in the context of several decades of historical work on comparative global history, sometimes known as American studies, and studies of 19th and 20th century imperialism that focus on comparisons across time and global regions. So let me talk very briefly about three pieces of Aziz's a counter-settler empire that are a corrective to American exceptionalism. First, it's been said that before it was a place, the new world was an idea. It was the idea of a place of plenitude full of gold and spices, but also a place that was empty without the disappointments of the old world, or for that matter, without the disappointment of coming to a promised land that was already inhabited by someone else. And Aziz cautions us that this was characteristic of new world colonization, that it wasn't uniquely American in the fact that the objective was not exploitation, but came to be native and elimination and organic notions of citizenship. It wasn't exceptional to have a fact of greater equality within the settler co colony than in the imperial metropole. It wasn't exceptional for militarism to arise as a response to perceived threats from indigenous peoples. The second correction of exceptionalism is Aziz's focus on the character of the British Empire as it expanded in the 1760s and reorganized indirect rule as a method of control to empower indigenous elites. And Aziz details how changing legal thinking in Britain from Cook and Locke to Mansfield Somerset decision and British policies of cultural and religious tolerance <coughs> towards uh, French Canadians and Native Americans and slaves, how these things actually threatened colonial autonomy and stimulated America's own account of republicanism and its twin account of empire. So for Aziz, America is best understood not in terms of Hannah Arendt and Gordon Wood's new beginning, but as a restorative settler revolt over changing features of imperial colonization. And there are wonderful set pieces here, uh, on the American response to the Qu Quebec Act. All in all, this comparative right, imperialism allows Aziz to see the American Revolution as a defense of a lost imperial status quo and the colonies as successors to British imperial power. And finally, Aziz retroactively applies the lens of 20th century writing on the basic post-colonial predicament familiar to scholars of Africa and Asia to the United States. Post-colonial elites centralized power, truncating popular rule, and one reason for this is that they were bound within a global economic system that actually limited their substantive independence. 
That says Aziz proposes American exceptionalism, rightly understood. Ours was the first successful settler revolt. And as a settler society, America had a number of unique elements. The most important for him is that economic independence was the ethical basis of free citizenship understood as self-rule. That is, it excluded from free citizens both dependent wage earners and uh, moneyed interests. The conquest was an engine of freedom because of this, simply because without new territory, you couldn't have economic independence and free labor. Therefore, that American republicanism was not inclusive, and the divide was typically between free and unfree labor. And more specifically, there was a need for a population that encouraged immigration and easy naturalization, that checked xenophobia, but in some cases, especially later on in American history, hardened the insider-outside divide. This brings me to my second set of observations about the dynamic of democratic politics. Huh? When I was in college, I read Frankie Fitzgerald's, she was the author of a wonderful early book on the Vietnam War called Fire in the Lake. Uh, she wrote a book called teaching, about teaching American history called American Revisited. And I believe that Aziz attends his, intends his book uh, as pedagogical, not just as professionally academic. He writes history as ideology and as inspiration. It's intended to provide a resource for populist politics. And in this, he's at one with uh, many American historians for whom the passion about history, uh, political passion, is brought to history. For Aziz, this impetus is reinforced by provocation from political philosophy, which is his other field. Because a dominant strain of democratic theory is ideal theory, that is in particular the, the strain of deliberative democracy that emphasizes argument and reason giving and coming to agreement rather than political organization and mobilization and ideology. And Aziz finds this insufficient, so he's provoked. So Aziz gives us a history for use, and his model is a populace who embodied the most sustained effort, he writes, since the revolutionary era to imagine how social conditions could be made compatible with freedom as self-rule. As I see it, in elevating the populace in this way, he has three tasks. First, he has to disabuse us of the way in which we associate populism with the bad odor of xenophobia and violence abroad. And he explains these things in terms of the two faces of settler empire and embodies it in Tom Watson. Second, I think his task is to set the populace off from the progressives, because the progressives really have become the baseline for lauding democratic initiatives today. And Aziz rejects the progressive ideal. For them, the, a democratic public acting through initiatives and referenda was an abstraction, didn't uh, 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 hew closely to actually existing social groups in conflict. <laughs> Crowley wanted industrial democracy, but he wanted representative unionism, not worker control. He could have added uh, an emphasis on the progressive confidence in administration and expertise. And finally, to make this uh, important for us, he has to show that the, what the populace wanted has moral appeal. What's compelling? For him, it's their universal republicanism, the identification of rural poverty with problems of industrial work, that is the uniting of the uh, Farmers' Alliance and the Knights of Labor, and the hint that republicanism can extend beyond the producing classes to, to be more inclusive. And the populace offered, according to Aziz, a view of self-rule where there was direct popular control of sites of political and economic decision-making, rather than the unusual course of empowerment, which is to incorporate a new group's elites into leadership. Uh, today, he writes, public life is marked by striking popular uncertainty and a persistent desire for change. But if we want to take the populist lost cause as a potential resource, a number of questions remain open, as Aziz is well aware. First, who are the populists now? Aziz concedes the problem by identifying actually mobilized groups, organized and willing to stand as a government behind the government. And I'll add that it's unclear with whom exactly the populists now should be in conflict today. But he does give us some hints. And in thinking about republicanism, Aziz seems to assign today a special place to immigrants. He sees immigration policy as a marker of the disintegration of settler empire and our capacity to reclaim the public Republican project as symbolized by our capacity to politically incorporate immigrants in the right way. The test is whether we can transform immigration from what it's become, that is the constitutional entrenchment of federal government authority uh, embodied in the category illegal alien to a site of internal uh, republicanism. And I think that Aziz is right about the importance of immigrants and immigration, both re uh, really and emblematically, but who and how. And the other open question has to, besides who are our populists, has to do with what I see as Aziz's ambivalence about democratic political action. 
specifically about the relationship between informal mobilization on the one hand and institutions on the other. He speaks repeatedly of permanent mobilization and parallel institutions. He lauds the populace for their residence with extra-legal conventions uh, after the colonial independence. His is, it seems, a democracy of movements and associations. Today, we have all sorts of extra-institutional politics, all sorts of populist as well as corporate interest and advocacy groups and self-styled public interest groups and social movements, although they may be social movements of the right. So where is the overarching or mediating institution apart from the episodic claims of presidents to be responsible, responsive to a popular mandate? So I think that Aziz's work raises the question of the significance of democratic institutions, in particular throughout our history of uh, political parties and elections and the partisan organization of government. And I'm reminded here um, um, in the Obama-Clinton debate in 2008, the, this, the dispute about whether civil rights owes to Martin Luther King right, or to L.D. J and legislation. I don't think obviously it's a simplistic either or, but democratic theorists tend to take sides, and I wonder about Aziz's. How important was it in his populist model that the populist had a political party? Was the significance of this party simply that it challenged the hegemony of the two major parties, or was there something about its own organization that was politically important? Was fusion with the Democratic Party co-optation by shadow populists? Or was it a sober recognition of how it is that political alliances are built and how ideas and interests can be translated, at least in a limited way, into policy and law, if at all? Can political parties be a site of permanent mobilization without patronage? The parties have been historically responsible for the political integration of immigrants, but the mechanisms they use are a sign of corruption. So as he speaks of the democratic legitimacy of political party, but I want to know what is required. What are the associational bases now that, especially now that churches seem to have replaced unions as the associational basis. And that brings me to my final, if I, I think I have a little bit of time, to my, what I think of as my meta remarks. An implicit lesson in this work is that Americans seem to require a collective purpose and achievement. And he locates it today in security and in the unique historical project of protecting national freedom and sacrifice for the liberty of other peoples. We've abandoned self-rule for security at home and global dominance abroad. And as he gives us a genealogy of this fallen identity, and he notes it's accompanying moral hubris. I uh, want to consider whether Aziz understates the role of religion, whether he understates the role of religion in this history generally. Of course, he comes upon in particular moments of the Puritans, for example, or particular examples of religious exclusion. And I mean to point here not just to persistent American millennialism or even American missionaries abroad, but to the way in which in American political culture we associate goodness with faith. And I think that this is particularly important today. Several factors lead religion to fuel Americans' moral hubris, precisely because religious advocacy in the United States today lauds religion in general. And because people of faith comprise a majority, religion reinforces the assumption that Americans are good, their intentions virtuous. Religion also reinforces moral habits because of the notion that faith-based politics redounds to the benefit of the nation as a whole not just to particular churches. It generates uh, a population of true believers in this nation of believers. Now, concerned democratic theorists propose ways of injecting skepticism in order to puncture American self-certainty about the rightness of American policy, especially policy abroad. But if our certainty is not a matter of the correctness of our policy, but rather of unshakable faith in the co confidence in America's unique goodness and virtuous intent, then political skepticism is not going to be much help. Tempering moral hubris is a matter of questioning our own good faith. The antidote to moral hubris is a kind of harsh self-discipline. So faith in our, er, uh, in our uh, um, erring, unerring goodness is not warranted. Aziz's story certainly is a sobering secular narrative that talks about uh, the ways in which we don't act in good faith. But I don't think it confronts uh, moral hubris reinforced by faith. My second and final point, my, what I call my sort of meta, meta caveat, is that Aziz presents the present moment as a critical moment. He says, American politics today is at a crossroad. It's an epical moment when, and I'm quoting, empire has become the master rather than the servant of freedom. The global attention to American politics is, is warranted because of this critical state of affairs. Now, this characterization of the present as a critical moment which is shared by many political theorists and historians, evokes for me philosophies of history. 
in which now we are finally on the path to enlightenment, or we have an opportunity to replace scarcity with abundance, or to throw off subjectship for free citizenship, or now we're at a negative crisis point. At this moment, we face an existential threat to the human species, for example, or we're now in a post-sovereign, post-democratic era, or now we are finally solidifying our bad imperial identity. It's as if the immensity of present need will evoke the necessary will for new institutions and moral principles and a new democratic ethos. It's a sort, I think, of enchantment, as if we can excite a transformational moment. So why do we? Why does Aziz resort to this? Well, we should never underestimate the rhythm of academic life cycles in the state of the field. Or um, the philosopher Kant, who said that seeing the present moment as a critical one was a minor motive for political action. Or maybe just a consolation for the fact that the worst may be an occasion for something better. And I don't want to accuse Aziz of being extravagantly epical. He's not. He's comparatively restrained in situating our moment in history. He calls it a crossroads, not an apocalypse. And in any case, and in any case, this is better than a democratic politics that's phrased, framed by news and election cycles. But better still, in my mind, would be ordinary political time. And that re returns me to what I take to be the main political question to Aziz about where we are now. Who are the agents with what institutions that can make, can make some headway against what forces on behalf of democratic self-government? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rosenblum. Our next speaker is uh, William Forbath, who comes to us from the University of Texas, where he holds the Lloyd M. Benson Chair in Law. Uh, Professor Forbath is uh, a specialist in legal and constitutional history and constitutional law, and in recent years has been concentrating on social and economic rights, uh, especially in South Africa. He's the author of uh, Law and the Shaping of the American Labor Movement, published by Harvard Press in 1991, and has two books forthcoming, Social and Economic Rights in the American Grain, and Courting the State, Law and the Making of the Modern American State. He's the author of um, a large number of articles, book chapters, and essays on legal and constitutional history and theory, and is a regular contributor to Politico.com, American Prospect, and The Nation. Uh, I've known Willie for many, many years, and it's great to welcome him once again to Ithaca. So, Willie. It is, it is wonderful to be here. Um, for my money, this is really one of the best law schools anywhere. What a wonderfully uh, and deeply interdisciplinary faculty, and uh, what a prize you've got in uh, As uh, that laundry list suggests, I come as a veteran in the field, disease is plowing. And I fancy myself also a connoisseur of the literature that lies at the intersections of history and constitutional theory that, that disease works in. And I'm here to tell you that <clears throat> he really has produced a masterwork, very much the most ambitious project in that at that intersection, its, its reach and its range surpassed most anything else. Um, to me, its, its foremost contribution lies much, as Professor Rosenblum suggests, in tying the history of ideas about liberty and citizenship to the history of empire and settlement and coining the notion of settler freedom. Disease has truly great synthetic powers and an even rarer gift for teasing out the core normative elements of complicated and sprawling outlooks and ideologies. 
I especially like the way he sets up the political and constitutional ideas of the revolution and founding period in the transnational context of overturning the British Empire, as Professor Rosa Bloom again suggests. And for reasons that will become apparent, I'm, I like his discussion of the royal prerogative and the governance of colonial subjects and the way that becomes an organizing trope that he carries through to the book's final pages. And that's about all I'm going to say in praise of the book. Um, so I just want to remind him he has few more enthusiastic fans outside his immediate family than I. And now I'm going to offer some critical remarks. As, as Aziz knows, I think the book's sure, sure-footedness dwindles when, when it comes to the 20th century. And, and so speaking more as an historian than a theorist, but an historian with some theoretical interests, right? Um, I think that re-reckoning with the 20th century and the administrative state is the task that lies ahead for his ease. I think that the account of the 20th century here falls into a trap that many historians and theorists of Republican, Republican liberty fall into, call it the golden age trap, the trap of a lost past and an irredeemably fallen present. Um, this elegiac kind of history isn't distressing for conservative thinkers, but Aziz is no conservative. He's unabashedly in search of a past that offers normative resources and reform visions for social transformation in the present. And I think his take on 20th century developments ill serves that aim. And it's also, I think, wrong-headed. The gist of Aziz's account of Progressive Era and the New Deal is this, that Progressive Era reformers largely abandoned the Republican project about outfitting Americans for self-rule. New dealers hammered into place a new intellectual and institutional framework that completed that abandonment and replaced it with a new vision. Freedom as self-rule, as political participation and economic independence gave way, as Nancy suggests, to freedom as material security on the one hand and national security on the other. Um, a decent livelihood was no longer a means or an underpinning for liberty, um, but the end itself. Right? The institutional accompaniment of this ideological sea change was the rise of the administrative state. Populism, populism recedes, and with it, in Aziz's narrative, the dream of a decentralized democratic economic life. Right? With, in, in its place comes the new administrative apparatus built up by progressives, the ICC, the FTC, and later in the New Deal, the National Labor Relations Board, all stand in this narrative as monuments to the demise of mass participation in democratic ideals and practices. And no wonder. Right? The administrative state, with its reliance on discretionary executive authority, is really, on Aziz's account, the 20th century resurrection of the old royal imperial prerogative, the very kind of state power that the 18th century North American colonists had waged a revolution to overcome, the very kind of state power that the 19th century Republican constitutional order had reserved for dependent subjects, blacks, Indians, women, but not white men. Now, under the earnest gaze of progressive state builders and the warm smile of Franklin Roosevelt, the royal prerogative returns in Aziz's narrative in the new guise of administrative discretion and bureaucratic regulation. To be sure, the new dealers who fashioned the NLRB talked economic democracy, and the era saw mass mobilization and insurgency in the new industrial unions, but the deep structure the institutional DNA of the National Labor Relations Act ensured that what the na nation's labor law would amount to would be the channeling of discontent into administrative procedures and top-down rule. Right? The progressives and the New Deal, New Dealers, and their New Deal progeny longed to make American government more European. And that's certainly true. 
And on, on Aziz's account, they succeeded all too well. They ended up wrecking the Republic on the shoals of European statism. This is an elegant narrative. The return of the royal pr prerogative is to me a brilliant trope. But as a matter of both political and intellectual history, I think it's wrong-headed. And as a theoretical matter, as a matter of political economy, it begs the question, this is a different question from Nancy's, it begs the question of what kind of legal and institutional apparatus one can imagine underpinning a deeply democratic industrial economy. And more pointedly, one can imagine transforming a corporate capitalist industrial economy or post-industrial economy in the direction of democratic forms of authority and participation. Can one imagine right, a set of legal and institutional arrangements that accomplishes this without, in very significant part, involving various forms of central state administration. Even for radicals, the devil is somewhat more in the details, I think, than Aziz allows. So let me unpack that. In fact, progressivism is better understood as having two currents. The dominant one um, is the one Aziz describes, the managerial or administrative impulse that celebrated expertise. But there also was a democratic one, far more continuous with the Republican ethos, 19th century Republicanism, than he sometimes allows. He concedes, or he sees, and love, elegantly describes that continuity in the realm of ideas and high intellectuals. But my claim is that it also endured in institutional projects as, and political ones as well, right? One can see it in the very state-building projects that Aziz sees as Republicanism's demise. So take the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission. What were the stakes in the railroad rate regulation debates that brought about the ICC? They were the nation's market geography. The aim of many of the reformers attending the ICC, including its first chair, the old mugwump turned progressive, Thomas Cooley, was to thwart what they called the forced centralization of the nation's manufacturing economy by emerging corporate elites in favor of more decentralized regional development. They impute to what um, economic institutional historian Gerald Burke calls regional republicanism. Right? In the service of the kind of republican political economy Aziz prizes. Or take the National Labor Relations Act. Aziz suggests that allowing administrative state actors into this domain to oversee union elections and enforce employers' duties to bargain with unions was the camel's nose for top-down, bureaucratized labor relations and a pacified industrial working class. But the history is more open textured. And the actual experience of unionized workers under the Act involved and has involved a vast amount more, more participatory democracy that, that Aziz <coughs> overlooks, right? As with progressivism, so here there were key state actors and architects devoted to just the kind of managerialism that Aziz laments. But there were also, both inside and outside the state, those who envisioned and tried to fashion, and for various seasons did fashion, an agency that opened space for democratic engagement in workplaces and also opened institutional space for movement energy and movement commitments in the state administration. Right? This depended, as they understood, and as was historically the case, on a politically active union movement, but that was hardly a pipe dream in the 1930s and 40s. It was a foot. So, in sum, as he plunges into the 20th century, it seems to me, Aziz's eye for the complex and contradictory faces of ideas and ideologies gets somewhat blinkered. So he can see, to his credit, the democratic and liberatory dimensions 
of institutions that many historians see as really calamities. Tammany Hall, right? Mass political participation um, in Aziz's hands is sort of what can I think say, is, as Nancy did more gently, somewhat idealized as engines of popular public political education and engagement. Um, but I venture there was a much popular political economic education and engagement in the CIO unions, which only came into being in virtue of the NLRA, than went on in Tammany Hall. Um, or even that went on in the lecture circuits of the People's Party, about which I've written as lovingly as has Aziz, right? So I think that um, happily for the project of sort of rekindling popular self rule and institutions that conduce to it, the, and this may just be the historian who always sees continuity, right, um, and, uh, and not um, epochal change. But in any event, I think there are um, greater continuities in the uh, 20th century with the impulses that um, Aziz laments than he allows, and I think that's a good thing, right? For those of us who would like to find in history, right, um, normative and imaginative resources such as those that Aziz looks for. Um, with that said, Thank you for a magnificent book and the beginnings of a beautiful friendship. <laughs>
on this thing. We're not going to have a chance to debate. We could have a debate, but it would be, it would be a minor debate. But as you listen, you know, try to think about those. What Aziz has done is written a book that's on message throughout the text, but there is a certain, I think, protean quality to it. And that's actually a characteristic of all great books, that they can be read different ways. So, Aziz has written a wonderfully rich and splendid book. And one of the reasons this is a splendid book, this is where I agree with Nancy, is that he clearly understands that good history should be written as social theory. He also understands that writing a political history, such as this one, entails a full commitment to political theory. We must have such a commitment, because we, in the writing of history, unavoidably judge the past in at least two ways. First, in constructing a narrative account, we impose a logic within which events, beliefs, and institutional development can be coherently related one with another. In this book, Aziz relies upon what he calls American settlerism as that logic. Second, we judge the past by relying upon it as a guide to what will and should happen in the future. There are dangers to avoid, and there are possibilities to exploit. This normative evaluation of history also requires a firm grounding in political theory. In terms of historical method, Aziz says that his book is not, quote, a work of traditional historical scholarship, but instead should be viewed as a form of social criticism in which history is presented in the service of today's problems as well as tomorrow's latent possibilities. His focus, quote again, on the historical past is ultimately and self-consciously instrumental, end quote. And this is precisely where his theory of politics comes into play, because it both, A, underpins his interpretation of the past, and B, delimits how we might instrumentally make use of that past in the present. In judging the past, Aziz both shows how Americans have conceived of freedom and how those conceptions have changed over the centuries. One of those becomes his normatively preferred conception of freedom. This conception combines social and economic autonomy, creative expression through labor, and inclusive equality within the body politic. As he painfully notes, this combination has never fully characterized American society, but it has come close, particularly on the frontier of settlement in the 19th century. And it is the generous impulses of that combination of rugged individualism with inclusive collective identity that he seeks to reclaim as the grounding for political insurgency in the 21st century. There is, however, a downside to secularism, a downside that might be inextricably implicated in its virtues. That downside appears in the emergence of a royal prerogative that historically granted the sovereign almost unlimited power over those who stood in the way of settler expansion. It also appears in the exclusionary construction of settler collective identity. As exhibited in the modern world, Aziz regards these as a pathological inheritance that drives both an executive-centered imperialist foreign policy and a rather viral deployment of American entitlement in, for example, contemporary immigration policy. Aziz has written what we might call an ideological history of the American nation, in which the mentality and value orientation of settler communities has been the central pivot around which most important political disputes have revolved. The mentality and value orientation of settler communities 
emerged from a combination of material practices through which settlers organized their lives and political conflict with forces, groups, and institutions outside those communities. From that perspective, there is a bottom-up dimension through which the material reality of life on the frontier provided the rudiments of what became a distinctly American notion of freedom. And there's a top-down dimension through which settler confrontation with other groups and institutions such as British imperial administration and modern industrial corporations forged those rudiments into a coherent political philosophy. In my own work, I would understand this combination of bottom-up and top-down as political culture, a term that disease uses but uses very sparingly. Much of the narrative that disease has given us has a strong determinist flavor in which political choices are implicitly decided within this political culture even before they are actually recognized as choices. And I do not mean this as criticism. My understanding of our task as political historians is to explain why things happen one way and not another. And that is a determinist project even when we are at the same time describing the scope of political possibility. In that sense, one measure of our analytical success is how much we can present as determined by our theoretical framework. And this book, from that perspective, is very, very successful. But that very success gives rise to some fundamental interpretive questions. First, who are now the bearers of American settlerism? When there was actually a frontier, the bearers of American settlerism were, of course, the settlers themselves. From a Weberian perspective, it is they who vitalized settler conceptions of freedom, bearing the ideology through time and putting it in play in politics. But who became the bearers of settlerism once the frontier had ceased to provide a material grounding and identity for those settlers? Aziz seems to say that the bearers have become all of us because, quoting, the centrality of settler colonialism to the development of national institutions and ideas remains essentially hidden in collective consciousness. He also notes, quoting again, Americans today rarely conceive of themselves as tied to a settler past or ideological project. He then adds that by failing to place the national project within the context of settler colonialism, public discourse in the United States essentially forgets the conditions that gave rise to American accounts of liberty. Basically, Aziz has given us two logics through which to understand the influence of the frontier on American conceptions of freedom. The first was firmly grounded in the material reality of settlers and their confrontation with other groups and institutions. The second came of age once the frontier had vanished as a material reality and as the pa passages I just quoted seem to indicate lodges American settlerism in the collective subconscious of the nation. The shift from the first logic to the second answers the question, who are now the bearers of American settlerism? The answer is that we all are. But it raises another question. If settlerism now resides in the collective self subconscious, how can we as a political community choose our destiny? The question reduces, for a number of reasons, into another. Who does the choosing in contemporary American politics? I don't know how Aziz would answer the question, but it is clear that he believes that a resurrection from the collective subconscious of the original settler conception of freedom is the best hope for recovering the right to choose our destiny in a contemporary American politics. 
If such a resurrection from the collective subconscious were possible, we could then ask, who could do this? Aziz suggests that immigrants now in the United States, when joined to the social coalition that Martin Luther King attempted to construct, might play this role. But he then more or less dismisses that possibility as remote at best. He then more or less, no, my own attention became focused on who in the past had had the most autonomous agency in Aziz's account. Settlers were the wellspring of settlerism, but they were tied down by material conditions on the frontier. Elected politicians were more autonomous, but they too were tied to settlerism through elections. My own feeling is that judges, and particularly Supreme Court justices, have most often played an autonomous, albeit supporting role, in articulating American settlerism. Perhaps it is the court that could reawaken American society from its current enervating preoccupation with security, consumerism, and passive acceptance of imperial policing on the world stage. However, as Aziz amply illustrates, the court has, throughout history, confined itself to reconciling the principles of settlerism with the imperatives of political reality. It is difficult to see why it would embark upon a far more insurgent role now, and given the complexion of the current court, such a role seems but a very, very distant possibility. There is another question we might ask of this potential resurrection of settlerism from the collective subconscious. As I noted earlier, settlerism has both an upside in the form of the more generous impulses of rugged individualism and a downside in the form of violent rejection and suppression of those who would stand in the way of this rugged individualism. In material practice, the virtues and pathologies of settlerism were inextricably combined because settler societies, by their very nature, were expansionary projects that forcibly cleared the ground for their own reproduction. But we are now haunted by a settler experience that no longer, as material practice, necessitates that combination. Can we now separate the virtues of settlerism from its vices? Can we retain and promote a conception of freedom that rests upon social and economic autonomy, creative expression through labor, and inclusive equality within the body politic without entraining brutal imperial expeditions throughout the world? In some ways, this question is more fundamental than the question of who might resurrect settler freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pencil. All right, now we'll give uh, the victim of our roasting an opportunity to uh, get his licks in. Aziz? Uh, well, the first thing that I'd like to say is uh, thank you to the law school for putting on this event. Eduardo, who uh, did all the heavy lifting of the organizing, as well as uh, Rachel, who was helping uh, me a lot. Uh, I also like to thank uh, the three panelists and speakers, um, Richard, Nancy, and Willie, uh, all of whom have been really key in a lot of years and influences for me. And it's meant a great for me that um, they've decided to participate, they've read the book provided such wonderful and extensive comments and feedback, and made the effort to come here from far away. So I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm not going to speak that long in response. What I think I'll do is just respond to a couple key themes that have been presented really across all of the different comments. Um, and the first one that I'm going to respond to is the idea of a critical moment. And what's that doing as a trope in the book? There are two different ways that I talk about a critical period of the book, and it's not something that I try to emphasize, that oftentimes it's used in the book just as it's used with various other forms of political writing as a polemical method or a way to engage and incorporate readers 
and the seriousness and intensity of the project at hand. But there are two ways that I use it. The first way is something I think is historically significant as just sort of a detested argument. I see the late 19th and early 20th centuries as a defining period of American experience. According to my argument, from really the early 17th century to the late 18th century, the U.S. was coherently a project in settler empire. This means that all of the different components that Nancy laid out were sort of ground, uh, bedrock elements of the American experience. So a radical Republican idea of liberty as collective self will over all the primary sites of economic, political, and spiritual life that was emphasized uh, by a notion of economic independence and one's control over labor as a precondition for participation. An idea that freedom couldn't be universalized, and so there would have to be outsider groups that engaged in the most degraded forms of work, for example, slaves, who are facing uh, you know, the other side of the experience of liberty. And then finally, a defense of open borders and the need for new, preferably European immigrants to sustain a project of other expansion. The late 19th century, for a variety of different reasons, this basic project starts to collapse. Um, that you have industrialization, you have the Civil War producing different uh, accounts of racial politics in the country, uh, you have the closing of the frontier that says that immigrants are now increasingly competitors. And what this means is it creates openness to thinking about the future of American politics and what elements of the old settler framework should be sustained and what should be overturned. And as a result, I view the period as one in which, in a sense, our modern state framework and our modern conditions really hadn't taken hold. And for that reason, there are a variety of different kinds of arguments that you see being presented. We have arguments by uh, populists, we have arguments by progressives, we have arguments by laissez-faire Republicans that are attempting to hold on to previous traditions of politics under circumstances where they don't really seem to make sense. This is how I see arguments about freedom of contract as expressed in cases. And what, in this context, the populists do is they present an alternative account of how a modern, progressive nation state could have been shaped and formed uh, in ways that avoid some of the pitfalls of contemporary politics. So that's what one sense of what a critical moment is doing. The second sense is a claim about the present. And so this is how I use the idea of the U.S. being a prosperous. And in my view, basically all contemporary politics, in some way, at a crossroads. That it's just the very nature of being committed and engaged with the political life. That every single moment is uniquely uh, defining of the possibility of pitfalls of what you can produce various forms of transformative change. And so in this way, the idea of a critical moment is, in a sense, uh, a, a, an author's trick, but it's also a claim that politics is centrally important regardless of the specifics of the time. But I do think that our present moment has the particular specifics. And that's that, in various ways, the social bases that sustain what I view as 20th century progressive politics, especially agrarian radicalism um, that was a part of the populist movement, but also in many ways a part of the New Deal. The labor movement that was a part of the populist movement, but also a part of the New Deal. And the civil rights movement um, have all found themselves demobilized to various extents. So the nature of transformations in agriculture Disappeared with it, uh, the disappearance of the radical politics of undergraded, especially in the South. And this explains to me a lot about the transformation in Southern politics. Uh, uh, the labor movement, in various ways, has become increasingly another special interest group. Uh, this is in part co optation by the state and processes that I both defend but in various ways lament that really takes up uh, contentiously as a problem in my account. And then also with transformations in the civil rights movement, where I view the civil rights movement as essentially having two different components. It had one component that emphasized liberal integration for black needs, and that was sort of founded through uh, the activities not just of professional blacks, but of members of the NAACP and lawyers in a series of court cases. But I see another civil rights movement that was really expressed by the activities of those like Martin Luther King and Billy Lee Boys, we saw the black experience as tied fundamentally to the experience of other colonized groups abroad, and also to the experience of those at home who found themselves victims of various forms of economic marginalization. And so that the project of the civil rights movement required, on the one hand, a 
shared independence project that challenged various forms of settler politics, both in the US and abroad, and also a universal and solidaristic politics addressing economic problems here. And all of these different social movements in various ways are in retreat. And so the critical moment for me about the present is the extent to which we have social bases today that can defend some of the, the forms of politics that I think are necessary, not just for progressive politics, but also for an effort to transform the problem, problematic elements of our institutions. So this gets to, well, what exactly is the defense of populism in the book? My view is that, in some ways, the dissertation, which this book was ultimately based on, had a central problem, and that it was, at root, a claim about a fundamental divide between populism and progressivism, and a defense of populism as a sort of nostalgic role the nation has to be returned to. My view, and this is something that I tried to work through and change to the book, is that that's actually, in various ways, fundamentally inaccurate. That there's a lot more fluidity between the arguments that are made in the populism and progressive period. And also, that the populist legacy is itself dual. By this I mean that what was unique and important about it was that you had radical elements within the populist framework that were attempting on the one hand to criticize various forms of colonial dichotomy and empire, so to criticize the treatment of blacks, to a lesser extent, even in some cases, the treatment of Chinese, um, to be opposed to the Spanish American War and various imperial tensions abroad. And ultimately, you see the problem that white settlers face as the same as the problem that various others outside of groups face. And that was the problem of industrial production and the rise of new expansive of the bureaucratic state. And that uh, populists presented one variant of response that was bound to a notion of cooperative production, to a re-energizing, especially uh, not just the labor movement, but really agricultural production. And that I view the populists for a variety of reasons as ultimately not succeeding in its task. But they didn't succeed in some ways because they were far more closely tied to settler politics and settler political dichotomies. So that when economic shared interests with blacks collapsed, so too did the impulse to engage in more universal forms of politics. I also believe that populists face extensive forms of external power and pressure through fraud, um, the use of an increasingly coercive states, perhaps modes of dissent. For these reasons, the populist movement wasn't one that was able to fundamentally transform the state. But it did give inspiration and provide legacy <coughs> for those other movements that we've seen over the course of the 20th century. And for me, there are two different forms of politics. One was what I view as the progressive uh, Republican element of the progressive movement. And those were ideas that were emphasized by thinkers like Dewey, but also Walter Weil, Herbert Crowley, and Randolph Bourne. And here, I view a sustained attempt to try to combine modern conditions. So the realities of bureaucratic complexity, industrial production, with the very problems that populists recognize about the changing nature of collective life. And so with the possibility of maintaining Republican politics. And at heart, this, uh, this approach that I see probably most fully realized in somebody like Dewey was an effort to imagine three different bases for a 20th century politics that sustains the freedom of self. One was a critique and an effort to limit the harshness of the division of labor, the divide in the workplace between forms of employment where people engage in task creation and control and other forms of employment where people just wrote or mechanically reproduce uh, 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 actions that have been directed from elsewhere. So it's the Dewey was simply committed to finding ways to limit the implications of the division of labor. And for him, it required two other elements. One is a democratization of intelligence or knowledge, so providing universal education for individuals, giving people the material and cultural resources in order to address the new problems of modern complexity. And the last was the democratization of leisure, namely the idea that most people um, should not find themselves ground down by work, but should have opportunities outside of work, one, to be able to pursue a variety of different kinds of interests, but also that work itself, precisely by being more self-directed, by being infused with education, should itself become a form of leisure. And that a progressive administrative state 
to play a central role in sustaining this new form of politics. And this gets to the point about the progressive state. So I have two basic views about statecraft. The book is not a defense of local decentralization. It's a defense of the role that the state can play productively in addressing some of the pitfalls of the market economy and ensuring that people enjoy the benefits of economic independence. And I basically have a dual approach to the state in American history. On the one hand, what I'm most concerned about is a trend that I've seen going all the way back to the earliest periods of American colonization, namely that the state is seen as a form of prerogative power that's applied in a discretionary and coercive manner against those that are outsiders. And precisely because it has this function, that it's not something that's supposed to apply internally to Americans. And so this vision of an aggressive and powerful state actually, in my view, sustains the classic sort of ruggedly individualist critique of state power at home. And you see it most powerfully expressed, I think, in Jacksonian Democrats who view the intrusion of state power domestically to change market relations, interfere with freedom of contract, as essentially reducing free white and male settlers to the status of outsiders. And I actually think you see it at present with elements of the Tea Party, where on the one hand, you can have a strong defense of laissez-faire economic policies, the idea that the market is self-regulating, and at the same time believe that the state has a role to play in having incredibly restrictive and racially restrictive immigration policies and pursuing various forms of benefit for all. And my concern is that increasingly what happened in the 20th century is that the progressive state apparatus became very good at the second form of state power and limited itself in its capacity to intervene democratically to readjust economic relations to create a society based on a, a, a much less extreme division of labor, democratization of knowledge, democratization of intelligence, and the provision of extensive social welfare so that individuals can enjoy the benefits of economic dependence. And it was this vision of statecraft that I see as expressed by Dewey and others. Um, and that found itself under assault um, increasingly uh, after the 30s. And the reason why is because of an element that I see as problematic even with things uh, like the Labor Relations Act and the new, what I view as a liberal managerial state that emerged. And that's that there were two different possibilities that state craft could take in the 20th century. And they were both conflicting and fighting at the same time. One was the vision I view expressed by you, social movements as well as individuals uh, that are democratically organized, collectively participating, can assert control over state decisions and use the state as a tool to implement various policies that are necessary. The second was an idea that the new progressive state is actually tied to professionalization, namely the notion that what defines the modern experience is that problems are really too complex for most individuals to understand. And precisely because they're too complex, it's necessary to have professional experts that serve, in a sense, as the decision makers. And that the role for the rest of us is to either participate at election time or to engage in various private pursuits outside of work. And that this professionalized vision of what the state is, is meant increasingly that state decision making is a specialized realm for unique particular decision makers rather than something that's collectively engaged in. Um, and it's why one of the things that I view as deeply problematic about this element of progressive state practice is the notion that there's an independent public interest that the state pursues that's implemented by lawyers and professional leads that's independent of the conflicting beliefs of various social groups on the ground. Um, and so I guess this leads me to the, the last point that I want to make about who are the bearers of settlerism. Um, in a way, I actually think the fact that we're no longer tied to the material conditions that produce settlerism in the first place is a great and open possibility. And that's because, you know, the arguments that sustain insider equality with outsider exclusion were bound in various ways to pre-industrial agricultural conditions or to efforts of 
uh, uh, frontier expansion. And those are really not our contemporary circumstances. And as a result, we can actually look to the American past to pick and choose the various forms of politics that we see as more consistent with our own aims and ambitions. And my basic view really is that we are, in a sense, all the inheritors of a settler past, and that there's no particular group, the populace or the labor movement, that's privileged in terms of its capacity to pursue a set of democratic or public ends. And that, in fact, at various moments, different groups have served this role. And so when I talk about immigrants at the end, what I see is perhaps that social base that's yet unformed in contemporary politics that can sustain new forms of Republican engagement and effort. And in this way, my argument is probably more decidedly um, in favor of movement politics rather than legal or procedural change as the best avenue for transforming institutions. I tend to view, um, for example, problems in executive power uh, as ultimately irremedial if uh, people generally believe that you need a strong executive to pursue a variety of aggressive or expansions aims abroad. But only if individuals themselves are organized to collectively challenge the basic ideas uh, can you see more positive alteration. So I'll stop there. Um, but, uh, uh, so I, I, I guess I can just sort of take some questions from yeah. the audience. Questions? Comments? Steve. Steve. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between imperialism and economic independence. That is, uh, I view the world this way. Uh, hundreds of billions of dollars are spent on advertising, creating a culture of instant gratification, hedonism, and materialism. Politicians, in order to satisfy that need, um, feel authorized and required uh, to engage in ec economic exploitation of other countries, um, sometimes in ways that don't really help our economies, that I would argue the war in Afghanistan, the war in Iraq, and so forth. But, um, and the only counter to this that I see is the horrible economic condition in which the United States is moving. Um, that is, the debt can't be sustained forever. Um, and, uh, but I'm wondering, when we come to the stage that we can no longer engage in imperialistic projects, what happens to the ability to maintain economic independence? That is, won't there be uh, widespread economic disastrous conditions in the United States? Uh, and what do you see as the political, the politics of that? Um, so, the first thing would be that the argument in the book is that uh, for most of American experience, <coughs> empire actually was the start of a, a pretty robust rich account of internal inequality and democratic freedom for settlers as high as the economic independence of type of And that uh, what essentially has emerged uh, since the 30s, really especially since World War II and the Cold War, is that you have a continuance of various imperial potentials, precisely those that are now taking the form of uh, forms of progressive international police power uh, interventions abroad, that are sustained in some elements of the old Southern America, particularly the elements that emphasize millennialism, so that uh, in order to be able to ensure that there's peace at home, all threats abroad, have to be addressed. And chaos anywhere fundamentally undermines um, peace and security at home. And the claim that I want to make is that essentially at present, these imperial pretensions are no longer really coherently tied to the service of any uh, emancipatory political ambition. And so, in a sense, they become ends in themselves rather than means to service of something that you might think of as beneficial. And I think that you've actually basically presented it by saying that. What they might sustain are various forms of commercialization or the various really increasingly structural and hardened inequalities and divides between not just immigrants and citizens, but uh, various categories of citizens here. And I guess the thought that I have in the book is that one of the best ways to address this 
is actually transforming how we view uh, the U.S. So that for most of American history, the U.S. has essentially been a metropole or a center with various peripheries. And in the 19th century, the periphery was the frontier. In the 20th century, in various ways, the periphery might be foreign countries that are either clients or satellites who find themselves continually facing intrusive police power. But rather, what we should do is think of the U.S. as a metropole, but with no peripheries. And so open to outsiders, um, but also wary of using foreign countries for economic extraction. And my basic thought is that maybe this is not adequately addressing sort of the structural problems of global capitalism. But uh, a transformation in the relationship between the U.S. and the rest of the world will actually centrally focus us on problems of economic that in the depths of this financial crisis, there's still been a tremendous generation of wealth. And there's also a tremendous provision of material resources. So it's one that's increasingly distributed in a way that's fundamentally problematic. Um, and so I think that the problem in the US, in many ways, actually continues to mirror what Martin Luther King described in the 60s as a problem of poverty and big money. Uh, and to the extent that that remains the case, then the refusal to think of outside parts of the world is useful for paradigm extraction will hopefully provide us a lens to think about how to transform this condition of poverty and to imagine money as something that can be uh, uh, reassessed in ways that provide that kind of thing that can invest in more people. But I also think that um, it's not clear to me that moments of economic crisis are necessarily destructive of economic and in various ways previous economic crises have actually been precisely those moments for generating new accounts of Republican politics. The 1890s, the center of the populist movement, the populist revolt, was itself a serious financial de decline. Um, and it left many farmers without land as tenants because of the drought of their political crisis. The 1930s was a depression that also ended up producing new forms of politics. <coughs> So I think that you can both on the one hand say um, the impending narrative of doom isn't quite clear, and that there's still a great deal of abundance that can be used in ways that productively help a lot of us. And at the same time say that economic crisis does not necessarily have to be seen as, as an either or game, but there's a diminishing plot. Um, so that that hasn't necessarily been borne out by the previous Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could um, comment or tie your narrative to the following thought. That another way of looking at your notion of settler empire is um, in terms of mobility. Mobility in all senses. Geographic, social, political, economic. Um, and that provides a foundation for your theme of continuity of uh, settler empire from the beginning to the present. Um, settler empire begins with mobility um, in which a group of people are seeking to, to break loose from change that inhibit uh, mobility again, in all relevant senses, uh, that creates a certain um, restlessness. Um, and that continues throughout the 19th century and continues even past the closing of the frontier. Um, and we see it in a certain sense accelerating in modern society where uh, just with respect to geographic mobility, the American population becomes more and more geographically mobile. Uh, it, it's a fruitless society in, uh, in a way that the European society really still is not. And certainly historically has not been. Um, and the same is true of mobility in its other respects as well. And that is an aspect also of our sense of freedom that um, we understand freedom um, as closely tied to 
are mobility. Again, mobility understood in a very broad sense, multifaceted sense. And so, uh, I'll, I'll respond to one which is the question of social mobility and how it ties to various forms of disability. So, uh, one thing that I argue is that a central engine that sustains similar politics, um, really through the 18th and 19th centuries, was precisely the idea and also the use of various dependent groups like African slaves or later Mexicans who were not white or Indian. Uh, that uh, the use of these groups as dependent communities and expansion sustained what was called white populism or the capacity for white settlers to enjoy the benefits of economic and the land holding or to be on the white side of the justifies the engagement of various forms of labor that were free rather than those who were as unfree. And in a real sense, I think that the frontier, as well as other problems, actually did provide the benefits of social mobility. And it's precisely that it provided the benefits of social mobility that America in the 19th century was such a, a ruthless and mobile uh, society. Not just uh, travel or, or a change in location, but transit is actually marked a lot of the American experience. Um, but I also think that always, both in the 18th and 19th century, even today in our discussions of social mobility, there's been a slippage or a distinction between the ideology of it and the role of mobility is actually sustaining various forms of economic hierarchy um, and the reality. So the, the very real experience that some people could actually enjoy the benefits of going out west, for example, um, sustained and allowed uh, various arguments about uh, free labor and unfree labor to be reproduced back home so that even in the mid and late 19th century, many industrial workers were never able to enjoy the benefits of being homesteaders. And even today, uh, the idea of uh, easy and fluid social mobility um, contradicts some of the baseline experiences. And so, in a sense, I view, I, I view arguments about mobility as part of an ideological apparatus that maintains a check on the kinds of changes that I'd like to see in how our economic systems organize. And it maintained a check in the 19th century by um, providing a vision of settler politics as something that was able to actually provide more people than it did that was an internal quality. And it's precisely the closing of the frontier that, in a sense, removed from the veil of many of uh, those involved in the very capitalism labor, uh, the notion that social mobility and movement west was so possible made them recognize the conditions that had become dominant at home. Um, and I also see today, you know, similar politics, that on the one hand, the civil rights movement was really essentially about social mobility in middle class bodies. And in various ways, the achievement of that social mobility for some portion of the black community has actually left the civil rights movement and the legacy of the civil rights movement without the tools to be able to explain well, what's happened to the rest of the black community. You know, what differentiates those that are part of the movement from the rest and the ways in which race and class join the movement. So mobility is a central theme. Um, it's a theme that has real depth and, uh, you know, you know, historical, it's a historical fact that people do the benefits of it, but it's also been an ideological Oh, we are unfortunately out of time. So uh, conversations can continue informally uh, with uh, Professor Rana. And uh, let me take uh, the opportunity to thank all of our speakers uh, for taking their time and uh, their energy to, to come here and participate in this uh, wonderful celebration. Thank you all. Thank you.